Thank you very much. Um, I've also had the opportunity to visit both Palestine and Israel on a few occasions, and the most recent was last September. And between being that and being a member of the Good Friday Committee, we've met many delegations from Israel and Palestine, civil society, academics, religious leaders and political leaders. And the one thing that came across on every occasion is the overwhelming desire of Palestinians and Israelis to be able to live in peace and also the need for compromise. Um, we look back to the past and we look at the Oslo Accords and the potential that was there, which came to absolutely nothing except assassinations and intifadas. And then looking at the Geneva Accords and the Geneva Initiative 2003 and 2009, and you look at what the comprehensive solution that that would have brought, there was a mutual recognition of both nations, their right to an independent state, and almost complete Israeli withdrawal to the 67 borders. And it was a recognition of a Jewish Jerusalem as a capital for Israel and an Arab Jerusalem as a capital for Palestine. And there was significant support. In Palestine, I think it was 49%. In Israel, 52%. Considerable opposition. But I do take that there are NGOs in both the Israeli and the Palestinian side who continue to work in an atmosphere that they can bring about some kind of compromise. I also want to acknowledge the work of the NGOs, particularly in Israel and in Palestine, who are working on human rights and on justice. And I was just at the launch of a book of their work recently called Defending Hope. And, you know, they speak speak about the great difficulties under which they are working together to try and find a just peace. We know that the roots of this come from imperialism, first of all the Ottoman Empire and then the British Empire giving away the homes of the Palestinians. Um, we know that the, the emotional, the religious, the cultural attachment of the Jewish people there as well. But you know the question is was conflict inevitable? But I think once 1948 came and 750,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes and their villages, there was going to be conflict conflict and we saw that that was the movement of Palestinians. It didn't stop then and it's not stopping today. And having been there, there's absolutely no doubt of the devastating and disastrous consequence of continued settlement building. It makes life virtually impossible for Palestinians and it certainly erodes their dignity as people. You know, when we look at the wall, the Palestinians start queuing from the middle of the night, 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning. They're herded like cattle and they're crossing over into Israel to work in the Israeli economy, to contribute to the Israeli economy and then they start that journey back then in the evening and journeys that used to take 10 or 15 minutes are now taking over an hour. It's just things like that that are making life so very very difficult and Palestinians remember how they used to be able to visit their relatives and friends in Jerusalem and Haifa and in Tel Aviv and Israelis would talk about bringing their families into Gaza, to the beaches and to the markets. We know, and I think also what always strikes me is the great resilience of the Palestinian people. When you see them in cities like Ramallah and in Nablus, they go to school and college, they're getting on with life, they're getting on with their businesses in the midst of all of that. And I have serious criticisms of both governments because I think both governments have let down all of their people. I have criticisms of the UN. We see that whole dysfunction of um, the Security Council, the use of the veto, America again. I do think representation should be made to the Americans on this. We don't have an ambassador here, but there's certainly one in the UK. Yes, Israel has a right to protect its borders, but that force that we have seen is totally totally, totally and utterly over the top. The role of the EU is something also has been ineffective, as ineffective as the role of the UN. It's like a facade, this support for two-state solution. And at the same time, it's like the EU is appeasing its conscience by giving all this funding to Palestine. And yet, it buys from and it sells arms to Israeli arms industry, which is bombing the buildings that EU funding is constructing. Israel has to be made accountable for its violations of international law and human rights. Palestine also needs elections and I think a serious error was made when Israel did not recognize the results of the last election. Yes, there were Hamas people elected, but that was a democratic process and it needed a peaceful transition to power. And so much of what we're seeing today could have been avoided. I think there's also a need for honesty. This whole business of the two-state solution, how can it be viable? It's like saying we'll put two counties in Leinster with two counties in Munster and one in Connacht and one in Ulster and we'll call that a state. I think there has to be an honesty and maybe the honesty is about discussing a one-state solution where the rights of the Palestinian people, they'll have the exact same rights as those in Israel, the same rights to services and to infrastructure, to education and to healthcare. A Palestinian academic just made a point about, he said that West Bank is an open prison 
but Gaza is like a high security prison. And we know that the, the statistics, we know the number of people who are living there, 1.7 or 8 million in an area that's the size of County Dublin. The fishing industry is a source of food and a source of their livelihood, constantly being pushed back in again. I just want to mention briefly two other groups who always get lost in this kind of discussion, and that is the Bedouin and their right to the kind of life that they live, and also the residents in the Golan Heights, because they're frequently forgotten about in all of this. You know, we have to start somewhere. What's happening now is has pushed everything back. We know that there are families, there are communities in Gaza who are grieving, um, grieving hor horribly. And I just came across, it's a Michael Longley poem I used to discuss in school. It's called Ceasefire. And it says, I get down on my knees and I do what must be done. And I kiss Akale's hand, the killer of my son. Something has to be done now. Back to the table to talk, to listen, to compromise, reach a consensus. And we have the example of the Good Friday Agreement. Thank you. Or am I good?